Our um, thoughts this morning are with uh, President Trump, with the one who was killed and those who were critically injured and all who suffer because of yesterday's violence. There's a lot of fear and suspicion in our country and I would encourage you as people of faith to um, not, not join in the fear and suspicion. May we find our way to peace and may we find our way to a future that all can trust. It's good to have Wayne and Luella with us. It's always a happy Sunday in the year when we get to see you. In six weeks now, uh, Cynthia and Kale arrive. Um, I guess I probably should punch slides forward. The, um, oops. Okay, there's a nice picture of them there. Imagine, <laughs> imagine that. Uh, imagine that picture. In six weeks, they arrive. Their current plans are to pull into Stanford with Kale's parents late on Sunday, August the uh, 25th, and unload their moving truck on Monday, August the 26th. Our current plans are to help them. So mark your calendar for that last Monday in August. If you can find a way to be free that day, plan to help Cynthia and Kale move in. Be here to greet them. Be here to launch the start of her ministry. Be here to reassure Kale's parents that folks in the Northeast will love their son and daughter-in-law. That may be the most important thing we do that day. For these, and for our church family, these are exciting and good times, and changing times. Charles and I and others will still be in the pulpit from time to time after Cynthia comes, mainly because we all want to keep her free enough to work with our youth, to work with young adults, and to work with families with young children. That's our future. But I'm paying attention in these weeks. And as these weeks count down, I'm paying attention to sermon selection. What do I most want to say? Here late in my life ministry, what do I hold to be most important? And in a sense, that's what I've been doing with this whole series on the way of the emptied Christ, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be clung to, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, a slave, and humbled himself, and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. That too is our future. It's the only way that works. It's the only way that ever works. And I so appreciate how many colleagues have joined me in this theme. Charles, Morgan, and Kayla, Karen and Laconia, and John, Tanya Hunt from Hope for Haiti's Children, and last week, Scott. But the text this morning is especially important to me. It's Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 21. It tells of Jesus returning to his hometown of Nazareth and explaining himself to his fellow townspeople in the synagogue. And his explanation is, we will see, a great window into the way of the emptied Christ. Now, to really understand what is happening in our text, it might be helpful to imagine Jesus in the years that brought him to this moment growing up in Nazareth. Yes, it was a village, but Nazareth 
we may forget, was a pretty exciting place for a Jewish boy to grow up. If you climbed to the hilltop above the village or above the town, it was as if the entire history of Israel stretched out before you. There was the plain of Esdralin, where Deborah and Barak had fought, where Gideon had won his victory, where Saul had met defeat, where Josiah had been killed in battle, that last great good king. There was Naboth's vineyard in the place where Jehu had slaughtered Jezebel. From that hilltop, you could see Shunem, where Elisha had once lived, and you could see Mount Carmel, where Elijah had contested and defeated the prophets of Baal. In the far distance, the Mediterranean glistened. It was a place alive with stories. And we can imagine Jesus growing up there and at evening hearing the stories and hearing the stories of his own birth and seeing the far off gaze in his mother's eyes and wondering, wondering what all this meant and where, where he fit in it all. Imagine him beginning to see the pain the platoon of Roman soldiers tramping through the village, the lines of crosses that he would hear about along the roadsides. Imagine him going up to Jerusalem when he was 12, eyes wide open to the glories of the temple, beginning to realize that somehow his destiny was, was tied up in this place. Imagine him beginning to sense his own power, the gift he had, and all the time wondering what he would be when he grew up. How would he define his mission, his life task? What would he take on as his story? Imagine him standing one day for the last time in the doorway of the carpenter's shop, remembering Joseph and all the great times and the hard work running his hands one last time through the, over the well-worn tools, tracing his foot through the sawdust for the last time, Real realizing that he was now leaving behind everything familiar and comfortable to do what? How did he understand his life story, his calling, his mission, his life task? And one day in our text, in Luke chapter 4, he returns to his hometown synagogue and turns to a passage in the prophet Isaiah and defines his mission. He sets out what he intends to do and what those who would follow him will do. And for this reason, the writer Luke gives this moment central prominence in his gospel. It serves as Jesus' keynote address in the Gospel of Luke, just as the Sermon on the Mount does in the Gospel of Matthew. We know that this story had special significance for Luke because he breaks out a chronological sequence and takes an event that Matthew and Mark place later in Jesus' ministry and tells it first. This is the first thing Luke wants you to know about Jesus' ministry. He's told about his birth and infancy, he's told about the baptism and temptations, and now Luke turns to describing Jesus' sense of himself and his mission. And this is the story he leads out with, because it is here in his hometown synagogue that Jesus defines his mission. And Luke wants his readers to know what this mission is so that as disciples of Jesus, as followers of Jesus, we will know the vision for our own lives. And we will know better what it means to be a church together. So there in his hometown synagogue, he seeks to explain himself to his own townsfolk, the people he's known and the people who've known him his whole life. And how does he define his mission? He's there in the synagogue, he's asked to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah is given him. 
So he unrolls the scroll and he looks for a particular text. What text will he choose? Now he has some options. He could have chosen the text glorifying God, as in, I am the Lord, that is my name. Isaiah notes that numbers of times. He could have chosen the text condemning idolatry or condemning immorality. He could have chosen a text proving that the Jews were right and the Gentiles were wrong. He could have chosen one of the prophecies against the nations and used it somehow to call down vengeance on Rome and oppressors everywhere. But the text he chooses is Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 to 2, which Luke cites a little loosely from the Greek translation of the Bible. Biblical writers often cite scripture loosely. Now give that at least a passing thought. But this is the text. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the captives and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. In other words, he inaugurates whole new possibilities and to all, to all who struggle to trust the future, the poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, the blind and the oppressed, he says, you can, you can trust the future. God will save, God will heal, God will liberate you. And that is his mission. That's the mission he chooses to establish a future that all can trust, to show the way to that future, how we might join with him in giving life to that future. And he alludes to the year of Jubilee described in Leviticus, the 25th chapter, the year of the Lord's favor. Every yeah, wait a second. The year of the Lord's favor, every 50th year, when a trumpet would be sounded on Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and liberty would be proclaimed throughout the land, and slaves were to be freed, debts were to be canceled, and property was to be returned to the family that owned it 50 years earlier, so that no one would ever forget that the land is the Lord's, as sure as the air and the sea, and people are only God's tenants. And so Jesus is saying that he comes to usher in freedom, emancipation, amnesty, liberation for all, a future that leaves no one behind, a flourishing future for all, and for that reason, and only for that reason, a future that all can trust. Luke takes this story and he tells it out of order, puts it first, because this is the mission Jesus launches. It is a mission to preach good news to the poor, to those who have lost hope, to young people overwhelmed by the daily struggle just to survive, to single mothers cleaning offices late at night, to the many who are haunted by mental disorders who cannot for long hold a job, to all who are discriminated against, to all who are wrongly imprisoned or years after serving their sentences are still disenfranchised, to those who are driven by warlords or climate change to desperately seek meager survival far from the land they love. The mission is to step in when families are broken and not up to the task as mentors, tutors, foster parents, as friends to children who desperately need caring, responsible adults to show them the way. The mission is to be companions to those who are old and forgotten, to bring hope to those who are made anxious and fearful by our fear-mongering media or to those who have every reason to be frightened 
who are under constant missile attack in Ukraine or bomb threat in Gaza or risk of violence from gangs in Haiti or from chronic warfare in certain parts of Africa. To heal the wounds of those who have been victims of abuse. To bind up those whose hearts are breaking. To help those who have no room, no house to come home to, no meal to sit down to, no bed to lie down in. To create a future all can trust so that one day, regardless of <clears throat> race or class or gender or sexual orientation, we can sit down together at the table of the Lord. And all this is the news that matters most. The news that matters most, even, even more than a presidential debate or a national political convention or even the Olympics. It's here in this synagogue in Nazareth, the titanic spiritual forces collide. Here everything is on the line. Here is the real story in which we find ourselves. It's the way of the emptied Christ. If we do this, if we take on Jesus' mission as our own, we will meet resistance. There are many people both inside and outside the church who do not want to hear this. If we read on in Luke chapter 4, the people of Nazareth don't like it. Not when they really saw what Jesus was saying. They didn't like the way Jesus interpreted scripture. Now what he said sounded good at first. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips, the text says in verses 22. But he went on to draw out the implications of his mission, saying this, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time, when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath, in the region of Sidon, Jezebel's territory. And there were many in Israel with leprosy in the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian, the archetype enemy. What Jesus came announcing was deliverance, but not national deliverance. This was not Jewish nationalism or Christian nationalism or any kind of religious nationalism. Jesus' gracious words were for everyone. His was a flourishing future for all so that it was a future that all could trust. But now as the radical inclusiveness of Jesus' announcement became clear to the people of Nazareth, it made them angry, really angry. They had their boundaries. God's good news, they thought, was only for people like them. Gracious words for only for them. Enraged, they tried to drive Jesus out of town and throw him off a cliff until he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. Their response pattern, this response pattern, becomes clearer and clearer in the Gospel of Luke until it leads to Jesus emptied on a cross. The grace Jesus offers so scandalizes, so scandalizes us that often we are unable to receive it. Jesus could do nothing for his own townspeople because of the boundaries they had erected around their minds and their hearts. How much more might God be able to do with us if we were ready to transcend the limits we ourselves have set for our love? We have these boundaries. 
around our faith, around our hearts, around our minds, around what we see and what we won't see. In our nation in these times, with our eyes on politics and the media insistent on keeping our eyes there 24-7, we can forget God and forget all the hurting people right in front of us. We can forget the poor, the brokenhearted, the captives, the blind, the oppressed. We can forget our story. So Jesus came and said to us all, this is my story, to tell the good news, to liberate you from all that enslaves you, your fear, your anger, your lust, to show you the freedom and joy that comes from forgiveness, to teach you to trust God whatever happens in your life, to free you from all the attachments that bind you, the things you obsess over that make you unhappy, the things you're captive to, the things you feel you must have, the snort in the morning, the glass in the evening, the website, maybe that house, that lifestyle, even those outcomes that you feel you can't be happy without. Jesus comes to proclaim freedom, not just free markets, but freed souls. We come to the call this morning in our time of quiet, and now we do communal, communally what Jesus told us to do, and as to proclaim the good news, to proclaim freedom, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. I hope you can see from our morning's text and the very central part that Luke gives it, dead center, the keynote to all that follows, that Jesus cares about the load you carry. Whoever you are, Jesus cares about the load you carry. Do you feel weighed down by life, oppressed, captive even? There are so many ways to be captive. From whatever ways you're bound up, tied up, Jesus and those who would follow him come to release you from the things you can't say no to, but you know you must, the things you take greater and greater risks to get back to, the things you feel you have to have, are you weary, feeling small? When tears are in your eyes, Jesus comes to you. He's on your side. Now you can trust your future. It all comes down to this, to trusting God and trusting the life that God gives you. And you can. You can trust God. And you can trust the life that God gives you. And this makes all the difference. From despair, it restores hope. From addiction, it restores sobriety. From isolation, it restores community. From anxiety, it restores trust. You can, you can trust the future. God will save. God will heal. God will liberate you. Just learn to trust God. Just learn what that means and do it.